Welcome to our May 9th service. My name is Terry Lou Birch, and I'll be your worship leader. It is such a blessing to be worshiping in the sanctuary on Mother's Day. Thank you, Lord, and thank you to all of you who have worked so hard to make this happen. Have you been thinking about joining the church? If you would be interested in participating in a new members class, maybe as a possible new member or someone who simply wants a refresher course, please contact the church office or Pastor Sherry directly. As the church begins to move back to normalcy and more events are occurring, please ensure that you let the church office know of any events that need to be added to the church calendar. For your convenience, quarterly calendars are posted on the flower board outside of the church office. Feel free to pencil in your events on those calendars. Your help is needed. There are several projects that need to be done in the meditation garden, along with some continuous work that we will need help with, like weeding and pruning and general upkeep. If you can help, please contact Oscar Bigger Jr. at backporch3090 at yahoo.com or call or text him at 614-425-1513 or you can give Bill Klein a call at 614-370-8574. Dinner and a Bible study is back without the dinner, so you need to eat. It's in the fellowship hall at 6.30 on Sunday evenings. For those who are comfortable with in-person meetings, that's what you'll do. Otherwise, you can do a Zoom meeting that has been created. Just go to Zoom and enter the meeting ID, dinner and Bible study, meeting ID 886-8377-0339. If you have any questions, call, text, or email Oscar Jr at the previous numbers we gave. On Monday morning, the Bible study will resume at 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. We will read and refresh our memories of Joshua chapters one through two, and they hope to see you there. Please continue to write your cards of encouragement to our healthcare workers. They can be short and from any age group, from children to elders. You can write one or several and bring them to the church. There's no deadline for this because this ministry will be needed for some time. If you have someone in need of prayers, please call or email the church office. A list will be made so that the pastor can include them in the Sunday morning broadcast. They will also be included in the next week's insight. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and those who are like mothers. May you all be blessed. This concludes this week's announcements and thanks for listening.
moment and glance around the sanctuary. We have done a quote-unquote soft opening today. We are blessed. The sanctuary is the same, but different. May God help us to celebrate the past, then relinquish the past in favor of a present and a future that God is in the middle of crafting right now. There will be glitches. This is not a change that was requested, but it is a change that has come nevertheless. May God help each one of us see the richness of the present and the possibilities of the future, not as threats to what once was, but as glorious continuations of a story in progress, just as Jesus represents a glorious continuation of the Old Testament narrative and a story that is always in progress. Praise God for God's new creation. Let us pray this morning. Creator of love, Savior of love, Spirit of love, join us, reside within us and within this place during our time of worship. Even as the fresh scent of newness wafts through the air, speak your love into our hearts, that kingdom love might infuse every sound we hear, every thought in our hearts, every word we speak, and every song we hum. Spirit of love and grace, reside within us, that we may feel your presence and share your love with all people. Amen. Hi, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to mothers, to mothers who aren't mothers, to people who are like mothers, all those people. Anyway, happy Mother's Day. I don't know if you know this, but this is my friend Winnie the Pooh. Cute, isn't he? Winnie the Pooh is holding my glasses. And why is that? Because that way I didn't sit on them. Welcome to the sanctuary, by the way. Very cool, happy to be back in here. All right, so I'm gonna ask you, well, this is my mom Bible. This is right there, mom's devotional Bible. It's the NIV version, which is the new international version that we're gonna be using today. What is just one of the things that Winnie the Pooh has to do with the Bible? What do they have in common? Have you ever thought about that? Winnie the Pooh and the Bible. Yeah, not really a thing that you would think of putting together. But let me tell you how this works. Kindness. Winnie the Pooh. Have you ever known Winnie the Pooh to not be kind? Isn't he always kind to all of his friends? He always shares kindness. He even shares his honey. That is when he didn't need it all. But he usually shares if he didn't need it all. What else does the Bible have in common with Winnie the Pooh? Does it need anything else? Pooh loves everything. Pooh sees the bright side to everything. Glass half full, this guy. Kind of like me. I always look for the positive. There's going to be sunshine eventually. There might be rain now. There will be sun. But we need to think about kindness because kindness matters. Winnie the Pooh knows about kindness. The Bible knows about kindness. It actually is mentioned 57 times in this version of the Bible. Did you know that? Me neither. That's why I Google. 57 times in the NIV version, kindness is mentioned. A whole lot of other times in other versions, but 57 times right here. So let's do some poo quotes. And then you'll see how maybe it relates to the Bible. Winnie the Pooh, all about kindness. He has said, a little consideration, a little thought for others, makes all the difference. Sure, that's kindness. It never hurts to keep looking for sunshine. Also kindness. Kindness is still free and still priceless. You're braver than you believe and stronger and smarter than you think. That kind of goes along with you didn't think you could do something, believe that you can do it. And guess what? You'll do it. Trust me on that. I know. I've been there, done that. So let's see how that compares to some things in the Bible, shall we? All righty then. Let's go to the Old Testament first. 
We'll do Proverbs, one of my favorite chapters. Chapter 11, verse 25. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Kindness, do unto others. Be kind, hold the door, smile, wave, whatever. It's a kindness. All right, let's try another one. You ready? This is Hebrews. Chapter 13, verse 16. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Hmm. Kindness. Just saying. Told you, they got a lot to do. All right, the last one for today. Philippians, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Okay, ready? Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. Goes back to that, what would Jesus do, WWJD? Jesus was all about kindness. He didn't like injustice, but he did like kindness. He wanted you, us, to all do kindness just like Winnie the Pooh. So remember, kindness in the Bible, yep, they go hand in hand. All right, let's do a repeat after me prayer. You ready, guys? Dear God, help us to remember our words matter. Help us and guide us to show kindness in everything. Thank you, Lord for your loving us every day. Amen. All right, guys, it's been great. I love being back in the sanctuary. Winnie the Pooh, he loves you too. Remember, spread some kindness, because kindness matters. Love you guys, bye. Our first scripture for today is John 15, verses nine through 17, and it's based on the New Living Translation of the Bible. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you would be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for. He'll use my name. This is my command. Love each other.
has changed everything. We cannot underestimate the significance of that statement because consider who we see in chapter 4. We have Peter, the grizzled Jewish fisherman and now a disciple. We also have Cornelius, who was introduced earlier in chapter 4, who is a Roman officer and a devout and God-fearing man. And as were all in his household, they were devout people. He also served humankind. He is well respected among the Jewish people. And he had a vision in which an angel of God told him to send for Simon Peter. So Cornelius sends for Simon Peter. And then a voice speaks to Peter, preparing him for radical service. First, because the voice challenges him to violate the Jewish eating laws. Then um, they call, then it says to him, do not call anything unclean that God has declared clean. Which might not sound like much to us, but why is that important? Because Peter is a Jewish disciple who is being sent to the home of the Gentile Cornelius. And Peter needs both encouragement and empowerment to go where God is sending him because God has changed the rules of Peter's faith and the rules about how Peter is saved. So what's important about that? Peter has been called to break the Jewish law that spelled out for their history with God that a Jewish man could not enter a Gentile's home and associate with the people who were there. Like Jesus, like Jesus, God has called Peter to quote unquote break the law for the sake of salvation and the growth of the kingdom of God. Peter and Cornelius are very, very different people, about as different as people can be. Who is Cornelius? We know that he's a wealthy Roman military man. Peter is a Jewish fisherman turned preacher. But God's plan included both of them. In Cornelius' house on this day, a new chapter of Christian history was written as a Jewish Christian leader and a Gentile Christian convert each discover something new, something significant about the other person. Cornelius needed Peter in order to hear the gospel message about Jesus Christ and then to be able to understand what salvation meant to a Gentile. Peter needed Cornelius um, to understand that salvation included the Gentiles too, that the Gentiles were a part of the plan, part of what Jesus came to do. We need others and others need us for all of humankind to understand fully who God is and how God works. It's what Jesus lived and died for. It's an extension and completion of the work that God began in the New Testament, and it changes everything about the faith that God wants from those who believe. What the Jewish people had previously believed had been amended because the Holy Spirit is poured out on both Peter and the Gentile converts as testimony that they are indeed included. You can't get much better than the Holy Spirit testifying to it. The Gentiles may not have liked the Jewish disciples who were preaching Christ crucified, but the Holy Spirit attested to that as well. The gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of them, even on the Gentiles. That gift was needed to prove that God indeed declared that all creation had to be included. From the time things were set in motion, the outrageous and ungodly behavior that we read about from Peter is now sanctioned. They weren't supposed to eat food that wasn't kosher. But now he's being told to go eat food that's not kosher and not to dare call unclean what God has declared clean. And he's supposed to go into the house of an unclean person, which would make him dirty by their standards. 
And yet, not only does God call him to it and prepare him for the call, God sends the Spirit to attest to it. Sometimes, God sends the Holy Spirit to challenge us because our logic, our training, our practices are going to get in the way. So what do I mean? Let us consider the Peter of Acts 10, who accepted God's voice as it spoke and did as was suggested, even though logic, tradition, and history would have advised that he never make himself known, that he would never go to where Cornelius' home was, that he would never speak to Cornelius or his family. And the passage begins like this. As Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message. And what was the message that they heard? What was it he was saying that got them involved? We have to go back to 10 verse 34, a few verses earlier, because this is what he says. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, God accepts those who fear God and do what is right. Then from there, Peter relays the good news, which is that God anointed Jesus with power and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus went around healing and doing good, changing lives, and that God was with Jesus, that Jesus was then crucified, that he died and was raised to life, and then appeared to the witnesses, but not just to everyone, to the witnesses that God had appointed, because they were then sent to preach to everyone that those who believe, anyone who could believe, would be forgiven of their sins. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, God accepts those who fear God and do what is right. Everyone who believes in him, Jesus, will have their sins forgiven in his name. That's what Peter was preaching. And it was upon all who were listening, not specific people, all who were listening to that message that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. On all who were listening to the message, Jew and Gentile alike. To us, that's not a big deal, but think back to their day. That goes against everything the Jewish believers believed. It was radical. It was as radical in that day as people had to realize that the Holy Spirit did, in fact, alight on all of them. Consider how radical it has been in our day when people had to accept that, guess what? The Holy Spirit was gifted upon all believers today, black and white alike, male and female alike, rich and poor alike, educated and uneducated alike, conservative and progressive alike, old and young, fat and thin. Peter had to get over himself and go to the Gentile Cornelius, who would have been dirty by Peter's standards. And he had to go into his dirty house before Peter could really understood what Jesus meant when Jesus had already said all were included. But Cornelius had to change his thinking too, didn't he? He had to first seek out this person who he didn't know and invite him into his home. And then remember that to Cornelius, snooty Jewish Peter, who had the nerve to be snooty when he was uneducated and uncouth, had to be allowed into Cornelius' home. When Cornelius would have known how Peter thought about him, and yet God used that unlikely pair to explain exactly how the kingdom was supposed to grow, to explain what salvation meant, which, in me, which meant it included Jews and Gentiles, which meant it included everyone. If left to our own devices, faith would not look the same. And you and I, because we're all Gentiles, would not be included in the plan of salvation, but God, by the Holy Spirit, had something else to say about it. And what God had to say was revolutionary in that day. And I believe what God has to say is revolutionary today, 
because the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message, and the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on everyone. Jesus changed the world. Jesus changed the faith of the people back in the days of Acts, and he's changing the faith of people today. He reminds us even today that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles too. The gift of the Holy Spirit is poured out on anyone, anywhere, who will believe. So the question is this, who are our Gentiles today? And how is Jesus continuing to change the faith of people today? What unacceptable tenet of the faith might the Holy Spirit be challenging us to relinquish? The world changes daily. And we who are alive today have to listen very carefully to what God is saying in the present context. We cannot presume what God would have us do or would not have us do based on what the past says. We have to listen for the voice of God speaking in the present. Notice Cornelius and Peter both had to hear the voice before anything else happened. We cannot presume what God would have us do or not do. We can't simply presume where God would send us or would tell us not to go. Peter would never have believed that God would call him to eat food that was unclean, but God offered visions to help draw them in, and then the Holy Spirit attested to what God had said. Today, the Holy Spirit continues to be poured out upon the metaphysical I'm sorry, metaphorical, not metaphysical, the metaphorical Gentiles of our day. As 2021 moves forward, we have to move forward too. And the voice speaking to me is whispering, or perhaps shouting, because it's pretty clear, it's still about love. That's what I know. But who is it that is coming our way? Who's coming to this location to find out about God? Who is our, quote, unquote, Cornelius? What will we say when our Cornelius shows up and needs to hear about Jesus? What will we say when our neighbors show up and need to hear about Jesus? Which of us needs to hear from our neighbors, just like Peter also needed to hear from Cornelius? It was an unlikely partnership, and yet God clearly drove them together and attested to it by pouring out the Holy Spirit, even on the Gentiles. Peter needed Cornelius, and Cornelius needed Peter, and God went to great lengths to break down barriers, sending the Holy Spirit, even on the Gentiles. Our Gentiles? Our Cornelius, God will be sending us some soon, but when the summons comes for us to get together, how will we respond? When Peter showed up, he shared the gospel message and the Holy Spirit showed up full force. When we share the gospel message, we should be prepared for the Holy Spirit to fall upon everyone who is willing to listen to the message, whether we like them or not, whether we understand them or not, whether we approve of them or not, whether we resemble them or not. We want our church to grow. We pray for our church to grow. And I believe wholeheartedly that God intends for us to grow. But when that happens, like Peter, we must be prepared, for God will again pour out the Holy Spirit on all of God's children, even on the Gentiles. Our God is a creative, loving, inclusive God, and amen to that, because if that were not the case, we might not be included in salvation. Amen, and thanks be to God. Let us prepare to go to God in prayer. Here are the prayer concerns and praises for the day. 
We pray that God would surround Marlene Weiss. We pray that you would surround her with your prayers because her cancer has gotten much worse and there is nothing they can do. So she has gone to her daughter's home to spend her final days. She said that she would uh, want you all to know that she is ready to meet her Savior, but she would still appreciate your prayers for her and her family during this time of transition. We lift in prayer Carol Lindsay's step-grandson who is in the ICU at Mount Carmel East. He underwent surgery, so pray for him, pray for Carol, pray for um, his mother, Megan Lindsay, also. We lift in prayer Leah and Beth Crocker and their family. Uh, Leah and Beth's father passed away Monday morning. We lift up Doreen, who is Jenny Schneider's friend who underwent surgery. We offer both prayers and praises for Angie Rogers. Angie's been ill for a little while now, so we praise God that she finally has a diagnosis, which is some form of colitis. We pray that the treatment would be effective and that healing would be fast and complete. Um, we lift in prayer Margaret Johnson, who is scheduled to undergo rotator cuff surgery on May 11th. We lift in prayer Margaret Johnson's friend Carolyn, who is losing her hair. We lift uh, our nation, the division in the nation, the division in the church, and we lift up our world and all that is happening at this time. We are living indeed in unprecedented days, and yet God knows all, sees all, and loves us anyway. So for this, we say thank you, God. And then we also say thank you, God, that Steve Cox's surgery went well, and he is on the road to recovery. So those are the names and circumstances we want to speak aloud. So let us now go to God in prayer. Won't you bow with me? God, we entrust these people and circumstances to you. We also lift to you in great praise all the mothers and mother figures who have blessed us in this world. We thank you for the love they lavished upon us and for the love that continues to flow from our mothers and mother figures, both present in this world and those present in life eternal. These are often the first faces of you, Jesus, that we see in our lives and in the world. For many of us, they were the pillars of our faith. They were and continue to be our cheerleaders, champions, medics, chauffeurs, teachers, trainers, disciplinarians, equippers, and solid rocks. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who would have been mothers, but the opportunity did not present itself. May your love fill any emptiness and heartache. Dry the tears that they have wept each and every time they heard or read of quote-unquote so-called mothers who abused their children and the privilege of mothering. We pray for those whose experience of mother was anything except what it should have been. We pray for the hurt, the confusion, the heartache that that situation holds, particularly on this day. And we pray for those who have chosen, for whatever reason, to mother someone else's child. May their blessing be as abundant as the large hearts that have moved them. We pray for all mothers who have lost a child, regardless of the age of the child or the circumstance of the child's departure. We pray for the mother who lost her child before that child ever entered the world. We pray for the mother who lost a child in the process of bringing them into the world. And we pray for the mothers who have had to relinquish care of their child at any stage or age after they had entered this world. Oh, great Father, Mother, God, we thank you for the great gift of mother and mother figures, many of whom taught us to pray the very prayer Jesus introduced. We dedicate our prayer this morning to all the mother figures you gave us, including a Jewish man named Jesus, who is the most perfect embodiment of motherly love that we might ever see. God, we are blessed, we are blessed because you created mothers and mother figures. So hear our words whispered in the silence of our hearts as we pray what Jesus taught us, saying this, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
constant is change. We can fight it or embrace it. Fighting it is futile, because in our case, we cannot stop the kingdom of God. If our eternal God brings change, our eternal God brings change. After all, the covenant God of Israel brought change to the Old Testament laws, and that change has a name, Jesus Christ. The covenant God of the New Testament continues to challenge us to change. This should come as no surprise, for the evidence of our very salvation is what? John declared it, changed hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit is our guardian. The Holy Spirit is our guide. We like that, but what happens when the Holy Spirit sends us someplace that we don't want to go? Asks us to forgive someone we don't want to forgive? Challenges us to love someone we don't want to love? What happens then? God makes change possible, but the rest is up to us. The God who breathed life into us is certainly able to change the quote-unquote rules, regardless of how much comfort we may take in the old rules. And if that's not enough, the world has special changes of its own. 9-11 taught us that, and the coronavirus is a rude reminder so if the world can force us to change, why can't God? Well, hint, hint. God can force change upon us, but God doesn't because God wants us to choose. God wants us to choose right or not, but God gave us free will. To us, the scenario with Peter is in some ways yawn-worthy. We don't see anything there that should surprise us, right? After all, we know God included Gentiles because that's all of us. But what we have to remember is just how different Cornelius and Peter were, just how hard it was to do what God was asking them to do, to let go of everything they knew, particularly Peter, the one preaching the message, had to let go of all the things he thought were really important. Think of the Jewish laws. He was told to break them. Don't call it unclean if I call it unclean. They ate kosher food. This wasn't kosher. He went into an unclean person's house. It was an unforeseen change that God had forced upon Peter. And Peter could have not gone. Cornelius could have not sought him out. But if they hadn't done what God had asked them to do, Christianity might never be the same. The gift of the Holy Spirit is poured out upon all who hear the message, even the Gentiles. Peter's Gentile was Cornelius. Today, who are our quote-unquote Gentiles? And how far are we willing to go to fight for the progress of God's kingdom? Food for thought for the week ahead. But the God of the Jews and the Gentiles, of mothers and planets and solar systems, the God of all creation, now sends us back into creation to love and serve as God decides, whether we like it or not. We don't choose what God wants us to do. We just choose obedience or not. But by the power and majesty of the God who created each of us, let us choose to go forth and love God. Let us choose to go forth and love all of God's beloved people. So let us now, by God's power, go forth to see Christ. Let us go forth to be Christ. Let us go forth to be God's love active in the world today.